Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar uh, the, for the Consortium for Research on Terrorism and International Crime. Uh, this topic today is on foreign fighters in the war of uh, in Ukraine, uh, which is a kind of unusual topic. We, when we talk about foreign fighters, we are used to hearing about foreign fighters going to Syria and Iraq or Afghanistan. But now, welcome. Um, Kasper Vekavec, uh, who is the main uh, speaker here today. Thank you very much, Tore. Very good morning to everyone who, 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 who has joined us. And then and, and thank you to, to, to Nupi, to C-Rex, to, to you, Tore, and to Thomas for agreeing to, to comment on the uh, on the issue. If you allow me, I'll share my uh, my screen with you. I have a I have a presentation on the on the on the issue. Um, I'll take it from from there. I hope you can you can see it. So essentially, the title of the presentation, the brown red cocktail, the foreign fighters in Ukraine, this is a kind of like a working title of, a, of an upcoming book of mine that will be hopefully coming up on the subject early in 2022 uh, by Rutledge. Uh, the brown red cocktail uh, refers to, to the ideological background of the fighters uh, in Ukraine that I'm working on. So I'll take you through it and I'll concentrate for a good part of this presentation. I'll be concentrating on the issue of their ideological background, because I think this is the when Tora said a known, a bit less known topic. And this is the potentially one of the most bizarre elements of this less known topic, lesser known topic. And I want to draw attention to this fact, because I think it kind of escaped our attention for the last uh, for the last few years when we were focusing, and rightly so, to a large extent on the foreign fighters in the jihadist or radical Islamist Islamist ranks. This is a topic that I've been working on on and off since basically late 2014. I've published for the first time on it in 2015, and throughout the last 18 months, I've been working on it with Counter Extremism Project. Therefore, you see the logo of the organization. And as Tore uh, indicated, I'll be joining CREX as a postdoc this summer, where a spin-off of this will also be the subject of my of my of my interest, and I will introduce this topic towards the end of the presentation. So, without further ado, let me take you into the world of the foreign fighters in Ukraine. So, essentially, if there is one thing that I would like you to remember at the end of this seminar, and to to associate with with this with this with this issue. It's this. It's the headline from El País from 2015, which basically quite clearly, uh, quite clearly states the case of my presentation and the, and the situation and my research. So we fought together, communists and Nazis alike, for the liberation of Russia. Well, let's maybe put aside the, the last part of the statement, but we fought together, communists and Nazis alike. Maybe for many of you that will be a pretty questionable situation, yet this situation happened. And it happened mostly on one side of the conflict that I believe I'll be talking about, but there are many more overlaps between individuals coming from radical milieus that ended up in Ukraine as foreign fighters, and that didn't bother them at all. So if there's one thing that I would like you to come out of the seminar with, it's this, that such ideological differences, I would say not a difference, it's a gap, it's an abyss, does not prevent people from actually joining hands and fighting for a common cause which, well, they might have seen it liberation of Russia, others might have seen it differently, but effectively they fought on one side. The presentation, as you will see, has basically consists of six parts. I will spend more time on some and less time on, on others, but essentially I'd like to tell you how many guys, how many foreign fighters were in Ukraine and who they were broadly. I would like to focus, as I said, on the cocktail, the brown red cocktail, the ideological ingredients that stood behind the fighters mobilization for either side of the conflict. And I stress it, either side of the conflict. Quite often in the popular realm, people would be telling you that the ones that the ones that we should be paying most attention to are the fighters who fought on the Ukrainian side, you know, the kind of fascist neo-Nazi inverted commas who were there. But, you know, there are way more, sometimes way more interesting individuals on the other side as well. And I'll bring this to, to your attention. I'd like to speak about their contribution to the conflict, which was, you know, it depended, you know, it varied. I'd like to speak about the aftermath briefly. So what happened to them since? And I'd like to speak, you know, as a kind of like the last two points at, about the policy options. So how states reacted to the fact that their citizens went to a different war than Syria, Iraq. They weren't jihadist foreign fighters or radical Islamist foreign fighters, but they went somewhere and they came back. What happened to these guys? What was what were the policy options that the states pursued, used, utilized? And finally, last but not least, the big question that I'm quite often asked that 
are these individuals a threat really? You know, do we treat them as a threat? Is this an issue that we should be worried about? Because obviously we had been worried about the jihadist foreign fighters coming back from Syria. So without further ado, let's move on to the first point. So who and how many? Now there is a string of numbers circulating uh, in the public domain, and I'm responsible for bringing these up myself uh, on a quite a few occasions. The one that you will come across is that there were 17,000 foreign fighters in the war in Ukraine. Now, that's a sizable number. Uh, that's not that much less than Syria, Iraq. Okay, less, but not X times less. But maybe as a consolation prize that, you know, someone might be saying, oh, how could I have missed it since there was 17,000 people huge majority of these individuals are Russians. Now, Russians and their involvement in the war have often been seen through the prism of the fact that the regular Russian army actually stepped into the conflict. And these fighters were kind of like diluted in the broader Russian intervention. So quite a, quite a, quite a many occasions you will hear people saying that, you know, are they really foreign fighters? Had they been foreign fighters or maybe they were just soldiers on a leave, as Vladimir Putin used to say, but nonetheless, one estimate that it's out there that I would partly subscribe to is that 17,000 were there, 15,000 were Russian. That leaves 2,000 non-Russians in the mix. And out of the 2,000, roughly a half are what I would call Westerners. Now, Westerners, broad category, broad category anybody to the west of, of, of Ukraine. So let's not get into this Huntingtonian discussion whether a Serb is a Westerner. Geographically, Serbia is to the west of Ukraine. So we, we would put the Serbs there. Around a thousand Westerners coming from also Western Europe, United States, South American states actually fought in Ukraine. The other thousand are people from the so former post-Soviet republics, especially places like Bel Belarus and Ukraine. So this is the scale of the phenomenon. Now, if you look at these individuals and if you look at their kind of, let's say, social backgrounds, yes, many of them are young, they are unsettled, they are ex inexperienced. You know, I try to kind of put it together, but there is no great master profile, as Thomas would know, of, a, of an ideal foreign fighter out there. And certainly that is the case in, 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 in the Ukrainian conflict. But there are things that bind them together. And the surprising thing is, and uh, you will not, you know, I, I don't have it here on the slide because I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that one of the fighters said to me in an interview, because I interviewed around 20 of them, that they are the two sides of the same coin. Now, he was referring to fighters who fought either on the Ukrainian side, on the so-called separatist side. You know, these guys were coming from very similar milieus and sometimes an accident, almost it seemed a coin toss, decided where they deployed, whether they joined the Ukrainian units or whether, whether they joined the separatist units. These were individuals with a very specific set of beliefs, many coming from the kind of far right milieu in Europe or in the West, who would have, let's say, anti-American, anti-European, anti-Zionist, and at times I would say outright anti-Semitic anti views. Yes, at times views that would be could be seen as outright homophobic, certainly traditional in a kind of, you know, societal sense. They had these things in common, but they differed on some of the tacticalities, yet it didn't, you know, prevent them from joining hands, uh, holding hands together in the same trench. And at times also it didn't prevent them from actually deploying to the other sides of the conflict. I'll just put it on the table. I know an individual who did not get a Russian visa to join the separatists. So he said, OK, so that I'm just going to join the, uh, the Ukrainian side because you do not need a visa to join the Ukrainian side. And he did. So that sometimes tell, tells you and shows you how fragile the consensus on whether I join side A or, or, or side B was. Now, let's talk about their ideological makeup. There are three colors, not two, but three, really, that you would need to know when trying to talk about the uh, ideological backgrounds and makeup of the foreign fighters in Ukraine. So one color, no surprise there, as I mentioned, they're coming from far right networks in Western Europe and not only Western Europe. So brown, brown, the color of, let's say, fascism. It's a simplification for the for the for the sake of this presentation. Then some of them are coming from the far left backgrounds. They are red. Uh, but at the same time, especially from southern parts of Europe, Spanish, Italian, uh, Greek, places like that. But then there's a milieu of individuals who is also brown red. You know, not many people know this, but there are parties like that in Europe. And certainly there is a party like that in Russia, the National Bolshevik Party, which basically mixes the ideologies of, of brownism and redism, if I could put it this way. So fascism and communism. Actually, their logo is a hammer and a sickle. Uh, placed in a circle, white circle on a, on a 
red cloth instead of a swastika. So that gives you the the idea of how they how they square ideologically and and how they how they work. So you have individuals like that flocking to the conflict from not only brown red but also brown red milieu. I'm happy to expand on it further further in the Q and A. But there is also a third color, the white. White is the color of the Russian Empire, the Tsarist Empire, the pre-1917 Russia. It's the Orthodox Russia, and quite a few individuals who are actually flocking to the uh, flocking to the conflict. They are of that kind of a background. So you have brown guys, you have red guys, you have brown red guys, and you have white guys. And somehow these colors do coexist quite well together, uh, especially and mostly on the pro-separatist side. You know, I'm happy to talk to you about how the separatist side emerged and how the conflict. Uh, how the conflict started and everything. I'm happy to talk about it in the Q&A, but I'm just giving you the bro broader uh, broader outlook on this. So brown, red, brown, red and white. Now, the key individual from the separatist point of view who was mobilizing people for this war, but maybe not internationally physically, but certainly the Russians for this war and drawing in some of the contacts that he had in Western Europe is a philosopher, geographer, Someone whose influence is quite often talked about as key in Russia, but it's not so key, uh, you know, from a practical point of view, but what's key to this conflict was Alexander Dugin. Alexander Dugin is one of the brown red national Bolsheviks who then split from the party and developed his own ideology, which, uh, you know, maybe not ideology, but he fitted into an existing ideology of Eurasianism. Eurasianism is an ideology that rejects the division of Europe and Asia speaks about the third continent, the Eurasia, of which Russia is the epicenter, and Russia is the core from which the rejuvenation of, well, essentially humankind, uh, and the rejuvenation, ideological, practical, social, and economic will come. And Russia is the leader. It's the true, traditional, real, orthodox force that will cleanse the world of all the dirt. Sorry to say this, but this is more or less how it looks like. And Eurasianism also says that Eurasia is in a conflict, perpetual conflict with the Atlanticist Anglo-Saxon world. So US and to some extent the UK are at the other pole of the conflict and we have to get together as Europeans to fight, uh, to, fight uh, to fight the Atlanticists. They see the war in Ukraine as a war between Eurasia, Russia versus Ukraine, which is supported by the United States. If you put on such glasses, this is a binary conflict, black or white, and you have to be on the side of the white, brown, red as well, and the brown, brown, red. Now, Dugin is mostly popular in many places in around Western Europe, very popular in Italy, but he's also popular in a place like France. French far right have traditionally deployed the anti-American continental tropes. If you if you follow, uh, if you if you've been looking at it, they are anti-American. They see France as an element of key element of European patriotism and federalism amongst the uh, European nationalists who will get together to oppose the malign Anglo-Saxon influences. And of course, Russia and of course Dugin with his talk is very likable in this sense. And that is the key thing. You know, the French connection is key because the first organized international brigade of foreign fighters in the war, and they consciously use that language, was a French-led brigade on the side of the separatists. It wasn't much of a brigade in numbers, but as I said, they used this name. It failed. Happy to talk about it more uh, in the Q&A. Now, it gets even more complicated. For the Duginists, for the Eurasianists, this struggle, this war is a reconquista. Now, you might have heard this term, the you know, the great reconquest, not the great reset, but the reconquest coming from the far right. Now, the guys around, around Dugin are also, are also saying, we're on a reconquista. We want to reconquer Europe with the help of Russia against the malign influences of the Anglo-Saxons. But funnily enough, on the other side, and here comes the interesting bit, there are people fighting for Ukrainian volunteer battalions of nationalist, of far right kind of, let's say, tinge, who are also saying, we have to reconquer something. We have to defend Europe. We have to defend white Europe against an Asian invasion. For them, Asian invasion is the Russian invasion uh, of, of, of Ukraine. So you have basically two sides deploying arguments, ideological arguments, which are roughly the same, but turning them around to fit their pre-existing kind of ideological uh, conceptions of the world and of the conflict and of the situation in Eastern Ukraine. So you will have units like the inf infamous rightly or not so rightly so, Azov regiment on the Ukrainian side saying, okay, 
this is a Reconquista for us. Reconquista, whose core is Ukraine and the traditional Catholic white central eastern part of Europe fighting against the Asians on one side, the Russians, but also fighting against the liberals from Western Europe. And then you have the guys on the other side on this, in the separatist camp saying, we are fighting a reconquest of Europe for Europeans against the Anglo-Saxons and against Americans and against the British, that kind of a language. And these two coincide together. And the last element of the cocktail is the anti-imperialism. As I said to you, there are people in the conflict who are coming from the southeastern or southern, southwestern also part of Europe, Spanish, Italian, also Greek, Melies of the kind of far left who are saying, OK, they are buying Dugin's binary look at the con outlook on the conflict. They're saying, OK, this is the war against American imperialism. So whoever fights American imperialism, I will go with them and I will join them. And these individuals are these ones, you know, I have no problem fighting alongside the Nazis as long as they fight American imperialism, because I myself fight American imperialism. And that leads you to this brown, red, bizarre cocktail in which these individuals seem not to mind who's next to them, as long as the guy on the other side is the projected, imagined, uh, imagined, you know, eternal, eternal enemy. Moving on from the uh, ideological cocktail, let's have a look, a quick look at how they contributed to the conflict. Now, some of the fighters on the Ukrainian side, they would be saying, you know, we were everywhere. We fought in every battle. We were there, we were shooting, we were, you know, we were destroying things, we were blowing things up, but so what? There were so few of us that we weren't really making the kind of contribution that so many of you think we did, we had. We didn't have that kind of a contribution. It wasn't the level. We were helping, we were of use, we trained some people. You know, any foreign fighter coming from the West with a background in the, you know, with a background in the military was of immense value to the Ukrainian volunteer battalions because they were saying, okay, I can teach you NATO military tactics. Ukrainians loved that. They put them in positions of influence as much as this was possible because obviously the foreigners didn't speak either Ukrainian or Russian. So they were a kind of a, you know, that was a bizarre situation because most of the units and most of the soldiers in those volunteer battalions on the Ukrainian side did not speak English. But they put them in positions of like, you know, influence and they were of public relations value. That's for sure. But they didn't turn the tide of the conflict. On the other side, there was a bizarre situation. Those brown red guys, they were coming there. They were entering Russia. They had to enter Russia to get to the separatist territories. But some of them would be arrested upon arrival. The Russians weren't sure what to do with them. They weren't keen on having them because they were not sure if, for example, these guys were not spies or if they weren't sent there to actually stir up trouble you know, to give the newly emerging separatist republics, and that's in inverted commas, some kind of a bad face, you know, to spoil their reputation. So I actually spoke to some French fighters who were upon entering the separatist republics, they were arrested by Russians and upon leaving the separatist republics after their contribution to the war was over, they were also arrested by, uh, by the Russians because they were unsure. I mean, who are you? Why are you here? What did you do? What are you looking for? Etc. Etc. Plus, the local side, let's put it this way, the so-called separatists, and again, so-called, they had problems with actually deploying them. Again, there was a conflict of egos. There was a conflict in the chain of command. They weren't trusting those arrivals. They weren't, you know, they were very distrustful of, of the Westerners, and some of the Westerners were actually bored. The only thing that they were doing, they, it, seemed, it, seemed that, it seemed that they were only put in front of the cameras to speak about their arrival and basically fundraise, crowdsource, so to speak, uh, for the cause, but they weren't given any fighting time and they went there to fight, but they couldn't get any fighting time. Now, the main thing was that, yes, the foreign fighters did turn the tide of the war, but those foreign fighters were the elephants in the room. Those were the Russians. Thousands of them flocked to the war in the spring of 2014. The Russian army stepped in alongside those foreign fighters, the Russian foreign fighters who were genuinely organized with state assistance, but they were genuine foreign fighters. They stepped into the war in the, in the late summer of 2014 and they did save the day. But somehow we don't talk about them because as if the Russian foreign fighters do not count because they were part of this mass of troops people on leave, uh, the polite men, the little green men, what, uh, whatever you want to call this, but they did actually contribute a lot, but it wasn't the Westerners who contributed a lot. Now, let's see what happened after, you know, in the aftermath uh, to these individuals. So the big thing, and that's the big difference with the jihadist foreign fighters, uh, 
whose treks and travels were mostly made or had been made even before the war, before the war in Syria, Iraq, illegal. In this case, going to a war, it seems, uh, out of your own volition and without any prodding from anybody and then to exercise your motivation, whatever the motivation is, it's not illegal in most of the countries, in most of the Western countries. So technically you can go and you can come back and you cannot be put in jail unless there is evidence of war crimes, etc., etc. But that's pretty difficult to prove, and as also is the case in the jihadist, in so many jihadist cases. But in some places, this was illegal. You know, you have a string of countries starting from the Baltic states, uh, so Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and then going south towards Bulgaria, so the post-communist states, in which actually going to a war without the consent of the given country without the consent of the Ministry of Interior or Ministry of Defense of a given country, and they're not likely to give you that kind of a consent, it's illegal to go. So the moment you return, the moment you step back, the moment you land in your, in your country, the fact that you joined a foreign military force, and it doesn't matter whether it's separatist militias or whether it's a, a French foreign legion, it simply is illegal. Now, I'll tell you later to what extent that cause, that clause, was used by those countries to actually go after these fighters, but technically, you know, they were operating in this, uh, in this kind of, in this kind of environment. So, what happened to these individuals? You know, many of them afterwards really wanted to continue with their war careers. Many of them wanted to be private military contractors. Many of them wanted to go into the army and use this, use their experience of the war in Ukraine as basically something for their CVs to move on and to actually showcase their their experience, but. Frankly speaking, not many were happy uh, to get these and were, were actually able to get these jobs. There is a one very specific Swedish case, a famous case where the guy is, is definitely a private military contractor and many of his colleagues would like similar jobs, but they couldn't get it. Some of them are truck drivers. Some of them are doing all sorts of stuff, all sorts of menial jobs. Most are lying low. But certainly one thing we could say is that they're not homeless. You know, they're not broken. They're not they're not broken. I think probably not broken mentally as many of them did not do any much fighting. So, you know, they're not really suffering from that much of a PTSD as, as others. They're not homeless. But if they thought this would be a career to some great things in many cases and in many situations, this is not what has transpired. Now, obviously, this thing was not transpiring for them against the backdrop of certain countries actually uh, welcoming them or not welcoming them so much and being forced to move on the issue because questions, legitimate questions were asked whether what are you going to do with your citizens going to another war apart from Iraq and Syria? Citizens quite often coming from pretty radical milieus, sometimes, you know, far right, sometimes far left. How will you react to that? Is this really what you want to do? Is this really, you know, are you OK with these guys going back and forth? Are you not concerned? And I, you know, I was amongst those people asking the questions, and here are some of the responses that I that I got, grouped it into five, and I'll quickly take you through these. One state, and that's Ukraine, was intent on getting a revenge. So it would be going after the individuals who were deployed from Western countries, but not physically. They wouldn't be sending, you know, hit squads to actually, you know, assassinate these individuals. So it's not that type of revenge, but they would, for example, raise the issue in conversations with foreign affairs ministers or other ministers or prime ministers of different Western countries saying, have you gone after these guys? You know, I've, I know of, you know, of cases like that, Ukraine pressurizing inverted commas, for example, Spain or Italy to say, hey, look, you should go after these guys who actively fought against us in Eastern Ukraine. What did you do? Now, at the same time, they were saying you shouldn't go after the individuals who fought on our side. They didn't do anything wrong. So you got the wrong people. You should really go against the if you really want to go against anybody, go against the ones who are on the other side. They committed crimes. We can help you with evidence. Whether that was the case, that's another story. Happy to talk about it more in the Q&A. Then there was another state, Russia. Russia had a policy of see you never. Russia basically exported some of or quite a few of its far right individuals to the war, sometimes giving them a basically a kind of like a no choice menu. If you go and fight on the side of the separatists, we will forget all the bad deeds that you did in the past, all the horrible things you did in the past, all the racist violence that you did, all the robberies, all the beatings, all the assaults, and we have files on you, and you can go and kind of purge yourself and cleanse yourself. Hey, well, if you die, well, that's your problem, but we're giving you a chance to go. At the same time, some of the far-right Russians 
basically said this, well, I'm not going to take up on this offer. I actually hate Krem Kremlin and Putin's regime. I will go and join my nationalist friends in Ukraine and fight for Ukraine. So if you really want a mixed picture, there was quite a few Russians fighting for Ukraine in this war, and they are still in Kiev. Happy to talk about that uh, that uh, more later. And of course, Russia is very happy to say, well, not, not our guys. They're not in Russia. They are they either died or they, or they are in Kiev. That's not an our, our issue. The third type or the third country, and you know, we cannot be talking about this without the input of the US, hyping up the threat. You know, for the last two to three years, if you were reading about this phenomenon that I'm will be discussing, we're discussing today, you might come away with the impression that all the foreign fighters in Ukraine were American and that they were all from the Atom Waffen Division or the base and that these organizations were very much in tune with the uh, with the guys uh, with the guys from the far right Ukrainian side. Well, that wasn't the case. Something like 30, 35 Americans fought on both sides of the war, like fought. More went to Kiev, had nice photos in front of the Azov HQ, but that wasn't the case. But for the last two or three years, the fact that such individuals and some of the far right organizations effectively they did, yes, reach out to the far right organizations in Ukraine has been hyped up to form a kind of massive death star type of a threat and making, you know, turning Ukraine into some kind of a, you know, new, new site for a far right Al Qaeda, if you put it this way, but that's not the case. But that definitely has been the approach, uh, even the, under the previous administration of the United States, which was probably more proactive on this front, and I'm happy to take, talk about it more in the, in the Q&A, than some of its Western European counterparts. Fourth issue, you know, the storm in a teacup response slash what fighters, it's the countries of this region. I'm talking to you from Bratislava, Central Eastern Europe. Quite many countries of this region pretended not to see any fighters. So you'd have like low dozens of fighters going from Czech Republic and Slovakia, and up until recently, they were saying, not our problem, nothing to worry about, these are just individuals, oh, they came back, well, not our problem again and again. Recently, they've started to prosecute them, but it's an interesting type of a prosecution. These individuals are, for example, prosecuted for joining a terrorist entity, and that's pretty hard uh, to actually showcase, to, 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 to give evidence on, since no state apart from Ukraine, for example, considers the separatists a terrorist organization. So you, it's pretty tough for you to convict them on a terrorism, you know, terrorism legislation. So these individuals usually get, well, you, you guessed it, suspended sentences. So there is a trial, uh, there is a media coverage, and there is a, oh, now we're going to be going after these individuals, but not much happens and they get a, you know, there are these maximum convictions that they can get is something like eight, 10 years in different countries, but then they get a suspended sentence of one, 1. 1.5 years. Now, another category in this, it's the, it's the approach of countries who are candidate countries to the EU. And here you see the power of the EU. The EU sometimes says, if you want to join us, you have to straighten yourself out in those many, uh, in those many categories. You have to get in line with our acquis, acquis, with our law. And for example, a country like Serbia, which wanted to carry favor, with the European Union and Brussels, started putting in jail the pro-Russian fighters who fought on the separatist side. Now, if you follow the ideological drift uh, of the Serbian president, Mr. Vucic, well, certainly he's kind of a bit pro-Russian. We could, we could risk this. And suddenly his country started putting in jail and going after those pro-Russian fighters. That seemed unreal in a sense, but it quickly turned out what this whole exercise was. These individuals were jailed, well, jailed for a day, then trials, and then given suspended sentences and let out to carry favor with Brussels. And now some of them are out in the streets of Belgrade telling their great world stories and telling them, you know, telling people how, how rough it was for them for those 24 to 48 hours uh, in, a, in, a, in a Serbian jail. And are still many of them are, are heroes because they fought for an orthodox ally, meaning Russia. Last, last part, the surveillance option, this is the Swedish option. You had 10 to 20 Swedish fighters, but there was a milieu of even up to 50 people from Sweden who went to Ukraine to support the Ukrainian war effort, especially on the Ukrainian side. And when they were coming back, the, Ukra the Swedish security service would be calling them for chats. And I, they told me themselves that that was the case, but not much afterwards happened. You know, there, were some no there was some noise about trying to put them in jail, trying to, to pr pr prosecute, them, prosecute them for some alleged uh, war crimes, 
Russia was apparently providing some evidence, but then people were saying, is it really credible? Can we, tr can we trust them? And it ended with a surveillance. There was a bit of a media hoopla around it. Some of them, as they told me themselves, they had to leave Sweden because there was a bit of media pressure around it, and I can talk about it more in the Q&A. But essentially, not much physically happened. You know, there was surveillance, there were some chats, but they weren't that uh, they weren't that rough and then unhappy for them. And, uh, you know, as the, with the passage of time, these chats ended. And that brings me to the kind of, you know, last point in the whole setup. You know, we have to really ask ourselves a question. Question, are these individuals a threat? When I started researching it back in 2014, late 2014, one journalist, and I will not name the journalist, neither his newspaper, said to me, you know, you have a cool topic, but it's not really important to the overall conduct of the war. Because like I said to you, they didn't, apart from the Russians, really change much in the war. That was from a local correspondent who was looking at the issue from the kind of, you know, Ukrainian, through the Ukrainian-Russian lenses. So for him, a few hundred fighters here or there, no big deal. But for us, let's say, extremist researchers, terrorism studies guys, uh, people looking at the far right and even, you know, far left militancy, that's a slightly different case. And it becomes a slightly different case, especially after 2019. So we just had the second anniversary of the Christchurch attack uh, in New Zealand, when initially what we thought was an alleged foreign fighter from this war basically conducted acts of far-right terrorism or right-wing terrorism in uh, New Zealand, attacking and then civilians in, in the mosques in, in, in Christchurch. As it later turned out, that wasn't a foreign fighter in the war. He did spend time in Ukraine. He had, or still has, far-right views, but funnily enough, this individual also spent quite a lot of time in Russia, and Russia, as I told you before, has a pretty vibrant far-right scene. So, you know, nothing is ever as it really as it really seems initially in this very conflict. But, you know, since 2019, there is an uptick of interest in the conflict, in the fighters, in the networks that produce them, and to some extent, you know, my research, you know, is carried by this wave, and I'd love to continue with it, and I'll get to, I'll get to why in a second. You know, it is true that the fighters, the alumni of this very conflict, they have a, this, this, this tendency to pop up in interesting places, you know, places of trouble, places for the rough guys, if I could put it this way, inverted commas, because you see the alumni of this conflict popping up in places like Montenegro, you know, if if you were, you know, uh, if we were to look at it from a good few years, you know, for, if we were to rewind the tape a few years, there was an attempted coup in Montenegro by allegedly pro-Serbian, pro-Russian forces. And some of the fighters from the war fighting on the separatist side were involved in the preparation of this, of this coup. If you are following the, the Yellow Vest protests more, and, more than two years ago in France, pretty iconic, pretty iconic protests in France as well, where, you know, some serious rioting came back to Paris and not, and not, not only Paris, some of the individuals working as the security detail of those protests, there were French foreign fighters on the separatist side as well. Then you had some fighters coming back and actually being those private military contractors in places like Syria. They did deploy to Syria to wanting to get a job with the governmental side, so to speak. That wasn't that very, that very successful. I can talk about it more in the Q&A. They also flocked to places like Libya and Somalia. Some of them flocked to Iraq because they wanted to join the Kurdish militias to fight ISIS. They were saying, I'll join the Kurds. You know, some of them had pretty far right views. And when I was conversing with them, I said, look, those Kurds that you are joining, you wanted to join the Roja Roja Rojava Kurds, but you ended up with, with, the, with the Peshmerga ones in, in, in the K KRG. You know, some of them actually had pretty socialist views. And, you know, since you're far right, it doesn't really gel well with what your background is. And they said, oh, you know, you talk too much about politics as long as they fight ISIS. That's OK. Let's remember the ones who fought in Ukraine. They were saying, oh, Nazis, communists, never, never mind. As long as they fight Americans, that's OK. The final point is the organization called, called RIM or RID, the Russian Imperial Movement, which seems to organize, which is now on the basically American terrorist list, which seems to organize some of those foreigners or from organizations who actively supported the separatists from Western Europe to train the, you know, to train, enhance their paramilitary skills, and then maybe in some cases sends them back into those Western countries. You know, Sweden is a, is a case in point here, especially in relation to some of the events around Göteborg in early 2017, when an alleged Russia-trained cell of Nordic resistance movement who trained in Russia with the Russian imperial movement, 
staged a series of bombing attacks and quite recently some individuals from Russia were also deported. Uh, some members of this organization were also deported from Sweden into Russia for fomenting some kind of an arrest. So you have these peculiar knack of these individuals coming together in those peculiar places and actually doing some some interesting in vote in inverted commas stuff. Now this leads me to conclude, you know, to kind of conclude that something like the Western Foreign Fighter Secret Society does exist. Secret because it's a society that locks people into a set of joint secret activities which we cannot access us, but we can, you know, we can get wind of these activities. We can sort of map them out, but probably an offer to join the society wouldn't be forthcoming for you or, 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 or me in this, in this sense. But this is a society, a traveling group of people who want to travel from conflict to conflict, who want to deploy, who will be looking for another war. And believe me, last summer they tried. They were really close as some of the French far right guys we're actively trying to go to fight in the Armenian Azeri. I'm dumping it down war for Nagorno Karabakh. They didn't make it because the war was simply too short, but they were already putting out statements. They were already trying to canvas people in their community to go back to this war. This leads me to this conclusion that some kind of a foreign fighter society does exist. And I've heard of instances that people would be, you know, writing references for one another to join different units in different wars. And sometimes writing of these references would cut across the front line. So this would be, for example, a French individual who fought on the Ukrainian side would be writing a reference for his countrymen fighting on the separatist side. But since they were both nationalists, that's no problem. We can, you know, join hands across the divide and the fighter, foreign fighter society would uh, would plow on and would continue to exist. And basically that leads me to the last point. You know, are they a threat? My project with C-Rex will be looking at these individuals for the for the next couple of years to look at what they had been up to since they left the front lines. They mostly left the front lines in 2015, 16, 17. They were out there. Some of them, as I've shown you, they've you know popped up in interesting places. And to explain, to help us uh, to help us understand whether these individuals actually are a threat, like the Christchurch attacker, you know, it's a, it's not a perfect analogy, but let's use it for the sake of this presentation. We need to know what they had been up to. So my work with C-Rex will be to actually build this up, to showcase this and to show you how harmful, how threatening these individuals really are. Because really are. this is the question that I myself am most often asked, but tell me what they've done since then. Are they really a threat? Will they do another type of a bravic attack? And you know, part of me is answering, I don't really know, but I will find out and you should ask me again in a few years. So I'll stop there. Happy to take your questions. Thank you, Tore. Thank you, Nupi. Thank you, Sirex. And over to Thomas and for, 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 his, for his comments, I guess. So thank you, Casper. Uh, I have had some, some trouble here with uh, with uh, uh, being in the loop, so I can't see you all well. But I leave. Uh, you can all send in your um, your questions using the Q and A function, and then we'll come back to that. So I uh, turn over the the scene to to Thomas. So please, Thomas, give your uh, comment. Thank you, Tora, and um, uh, th thanks to, to, to Nupi for, for inviting me and for organizing this, and uh, special thanks to, to Kasper for this great uh, presentation. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a great um, pleasure not just to have uh, Kasper speak here, but to sort of to the prospect of having him in Oslo, being based uh, at CREX, and uh, to continue this conversation um in the in the years ahead um yeah so um i'm very glad to have uh casper in, in in oslo soon and and because this is a really um i think fruitful um topic uh, uh and there are so many obviously so many points of comparison and um and, uh, and and parallels here with uh, other forms of um, of foreign fighting. Um, what, what I also really appreciate about uh, 
uh, Kasper's work and general approach is um, a uh, you know a, a certain sort of a strong empiricism and a, and a, a sort, of, sort of a balanced approach to this because there is a I think there is a there is a risk when talking about foreign fighters of kind of um, overemphasizing overemphasizing the similarities. So the, the, I think there is a, many of us have a sort of a, a, a hunch or perhaps a sort of de, a, de, a desire to sort of to to, to see all the types of you know, violent extremism as essentially the same. And, and, and to, because we you know there's this sort of universalist sort of assumption in much of kind of social science and, 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 and political analysis, I think. So there's a, there's a, I think there's a, there's a danger of kind of assuming uh, similarity uh, when I think, you know, often there are um, important differences as well and, and, and Kasper's work is able to 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 sort of ba ba balance that um, inquiry well um, to see similarities where where there are similarities and to um, well not at the same time not jumping on to the conclusion that uh, you know everyone in Ukraine are sort of as you know they're, they're like uh, sort of Islamic State uh, fighters. Now, <clears throat> um, I think I want to focus though on on these sort of slight differences with with the jihadis because I think that the, the similarities are fairly obvious. That, you know, we're, we're dealing with you know, people who travel to another war zone um, for ideological reasons, uh, and they're in. Uh, an, an internet, a transnational community. They build international networks that persist after the conflict is over. They are probably, you know, hardened and radicalized by the experience, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are fairly obvious uh, sort of simil similarities. Um, so I'll focus on the what, what I see as slight sort of differences. Um, uh, and the first one c comes from sort of the one of the main points in the talk, which is this sort of ideological mix of of having kind of neo Nazis and communists and other um, shades of the political spectrum in the in the um, you know fighting side by side and fraternizing. And that's something that I'd, I'd argue we haven't seen nearly to the same extent on the militant. Islamist side. Uh, now it's true that in a conflict like you know Syria in the 2010s or Afghanistan in the 1980s, you had different shades of Islamism. You had you had you know people coming in from very from a range of different kind of groups and 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 backgrounds, but the overall kind of ideological narrative uh, and the, 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 the overall kind of uh, political color, if you will, I think was much more homogenous than what we're seeing, uh, what we're seeing or what we have seen in, in the Ukraine. Um, the um, another, I think, um, um, sort of slight difference h here, which, uh, well, although well, uh, I think a key part of the Ukrainian conflict for understanding the large numbers is the role of uh, states, so the, the role of Russia in particular and, and, and the Ukraine in sort of um, setting, you know, the constraints for joining foreign fighters. Now, there have been some foreign fighter kind of Conflicts involving, you know, sort of jihadi foreign fighter destinations that have had that sort of strong level of kind of state support, especially especially out of Afghanistan in the 1980s with Pakistan and to some to some extent also with Syria and the role that Turkey played. Um, but it seems to me that here, you know, R Russia in particular is playing a very important role in kind of um, uh, regulating the flow. Of 
people you know who can access the the the, 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 the conflict, and that's that's pretty significant. It, it points, by the way, to 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 a general I think aspect of foreign fighting, which is the that the states can matter a lot. That typically when when most of the conflicts that that attract really large numbers of foreign fighters um, uh, have had kind of a state nearby that has facilitated it or kind of allowed it. Um, another um, kind of point, uh, although it perhaps, it's perhaps a um, a uh, question more than a, a point, but it, and it re regards to kind of the ideological agenda of the people on the ground. So. Um, um, I think, uh, and it's about the extent to which actors in the conflict theater seem to have military ambitions outside of that conflict. Uh, and, and this is important, prime, you know, uh, this is quite important, I think, for assessing risk. Um, uh, because it matters whether you have an, an organization or an actor in the conflict theater where, where for the foreign fighters are coming um, that has a declared strategy of wishing to kind of attack elsewhere or wage war elsewhere. So, for example, um, you know, when you have an, an organization like Al Qaeda in Afghanistan, uh, that matters for how you assess the people who go to Afghanistan to join these Al Qaeda camps, because it's an organization that has a declared strategy of attacking the West, for example, or especially in you know, Syria after, say, the autumn of 2014, when IS has a declared strategy of attacking the West. That matters for uh, how you view those um, those foreign fighters. And now I don't know enough about the ideological Sort of agendas of the actors on the ground and the conversations that people seem to have in the foreign fighter community uh, in the Ukraine to to say, but just my, my general impression is that you don't seem to have a, a group or an, or an actor or a network with you know with very clear and sort of aggressive kind of ambitions beyond 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 the, the Ukraine. Um, another sort of sort of final. Uh, point I mean I have other remarks but but I don't want to I want to leave some time for for questions from the from the listeners as well um, another thing that struck me is that um, it seemed to seems to me here again I don't know enough about the far right uh, in Europe but it seems to me that the the the, the relative prominence of the Ukraine conflict on the agenda of various local far right communities across Europe is smaller than, say, the Syria conflict was to Islamists across Europe in 2013 14, for example, or that you know the Afghanistan conflict played for Islamists across the world in the, in the 1980s. I think perhaps the Syria conflict is the most is the starkest example where, you know, in 20, 2012, 2013, Syria really was the predominant issue, you know, that all the, the, the sort of the entire, you know, transnational network of transnational jihadists were focused, focused on because kind of all that matters. There were many people were just consumed with this conflict and watching videos all the time from the from the conflict zone. It seems to me, although here, as I mentioned, I, I, I don't follow the far right as closely, but it seems to me that the, you know, the far right communities, for example, in Scandinavia, you know, they, they know about the Korean War and some people are going, but it's not this all consuming conflict uh, that keeps them awake at night. Um, uh, they are doing a lot of other things and Ukraine is sort of competing for with other things for for their attention. I think perhaps this has to do with this, with the the, um, the, the basically the, the 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 national orientation or the nationalist orientations of 
you know that's inherent it's not exclusive but it, but it's but it's present in the in the far right to perhaps a larger extent than, than the, the, the jihadis so i think you know this is a really fascinating uh topic and i think it gets more interesting when when we when we look at the the fissures the slight sort of differences bring out the the nuances in this in, in this talk but i want to commend you Casper, for 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 doing this work i mean you were a pioneer in this field and uh, and um and uh have done have made a, a great contribution to the study of of uh, of foreign fighters so so thank you and i look forward to the conversation Well, thank you to Casper and Thomas. Um, we have had some technical problems here, uh, so I hope it uh, worked out uh, well on your side. We have now about uh, 16 questions. We are probably not able to take uh, all of them, but uh, just take start with one. Um, thank you for, from, from OM. I'm not quite sure what that stands for. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. What are the similarities and differences with the dynamics of earlier foreign fighter hotspots, mentioning the Spanish Civil War. I think I could also mention the, the to follow up on, on the Balkans War, because we had, uh, for example, in Sweden, we had a case where a person from Sweden was first convicted uh, for uh, war crimes in, in, uh, in the Balkans, and then he returned to Sweden and he he ended up as uh, joining the Nazi a Nazi group, and they committed the murder of two police officers in Alexander in in uh, 99, uh, which uh, links to uh, to what degree does this current situation link to previous foreign fighter um, uh, in, uh, situations? Thank you, Tore. Thank you, Thomas, for your comments. Uh, I'll try and, 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 and be brief uh, so that we can take mo mo you know, as, much, as many questions as possible. So, yes, you're right. The Balkans, that's an obvious point of reference because the Balkans were in the 1990s. This is merely 20 years later. And in this sense, you can have individuals who flocked to this war to one and the other. So the link is there, the similarity is there because you sometimes have the same people, literally the same people who fought maybe as 20 year olds in the Balkans war and now they're you know, hitting up on 50 and they play more prominent roles. I'll give you two, ex two examples really. One is the iconic example of a guy who basically started this war, you know, Igor Girkin, he was probably, most probably an operative of, a, of, a, of a Russian military intelligence but he is the one who walks with a group of 50 people into eastern Ukraine from Russia in April 2014 and starts it off as a war, not as a civil conflict, not as rioting or things like that, but as a war. He, he transforms it into the war. He's the one who's not afraid for the first to actually shoot people. Because before that, there is this kind of, you know, there is this reluctance to go that far, but he doesn't, and he is a veteran of the war in the Balkans. On the other side, you have people who fought in the Balkans on the Croat side. Girkin fought on the Serbian side, if I could really dump it down in this sense. You have veterans on the Croat side who are organizing people using their contact books, their phones, their emails with the good old friends from the 1990s to actually propel them and their friends and their followers to the war in Ukraine. So if you if we're looking for, for similarities, there are plenty in a sense in organizational terms. You know, you need networks, just like there were networks in the 1930s, the communist or Trotskyite or fascist networks, you know, channeling people to, uh, to, to Spain. There were networks in the 1990s channeling people, orthodox networks for the Serbs, maybe Catholic networks in France for the Croats. The same networks to some extent, and I agree with Thomas, that was a great comment saying that, you know, not so much, you know, inflamed, not so much consumed by this war, but it's the same network that channels people into, into the Ukrainian war. So, I, you know, Tore, if you're asking, you know, the question is about the similarities, I would say these are, these are the similarities, and the main one is the continuity, you know. This is the argument for the Western foreign fighter secret society that it's sometimes the same guys who basically pop up in one B uh, or A, B and maybe C in the future.
I could also add that we are also hiring another uh, postdoc at CIREX starting in the fall. Nathaniel Kunkler is a historian and he is studying foreign fighters in the interwar period between the First and Second World War. And he is looking at many of the same uh, processes and many of the same networks of foreign fighters. So, so this is uh, really a, an interesting peril. Uh, we have another um, uh, question here from Wojtek Markowski, if I pronounce it correctly. Kasper, you mentioned the media hype about the conviction of these people in Sweden, but what was the attitude of societies in the West? Were these people somehow excluded from their local communities after they came back from the war? Was there any kind of public conviction? Did these people change their place of residence, uh, for example, moving from France and Sweden to Russian Balkans as a result of some social pressure? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, I would say it's a two-sided answer, really. Uh, Swedish case, there was pressure. They were written about in the newspapers. And I've interviewed, I think, four of them. And they themselves told me that they felt that there was basically a campaign in the court of public opinion against them. And they couldn't stay in Sweden. They were unhappy about Sweden before the war. Don't get me wrong. That, that's another thing. And they themselves felt that they couldn't stay in Sweden. Uh, it's a, as, and I'm quoting them, it's a degenerate society. It's a society that's about to fall. It's not for them. It has never taken the, taken them seriously in any way, shape or form. And for this reason, that was just another, you know, springboard for them to actually move somewhere else. You know, we're not getting into the uh, intraxity, intransities of, of why they would be saying this, but that's more or less what they were saying. But then on the other hand, guys from France who fought on the separatist side, who came back to France, they are free to give lectures and talks about their experience in Ukraine. They would be giving interviews like, you know, like I spoke to them, but on a one to one basis, whereas others, you know, they would be actually uh, they would be hosted by different political, social, humanitarian or whatever organizations and they would be there. So on this, you know, in this sense and on this front, that varies, you know, it's not straightforward. It's never it's never black and white. Largely, I would say they were able to come back. Uh, they they kept their heads down and I would say that's the case. But even when they didn't, in many of the instances, they simply found milieus that were accommodating for them, you know, far right, far left, or this brown red, or what have you, anti-systemic. And, you know, that was bizarre. You know, you had these guys actually going on tours around Europe to pontificate about the war, you know, to fundraise for their comrades who are still out there. And sometimes they would be going to places that you wouldn't expect them to go. You know, uh, you had fighters going, you know, fighters on the pro-separatist side, they would be going to the Central Eastern European countries who would be instinctively anti-Russian in a sense, yet they were still able to go there, you know, have a meeting, uh, go to a music concert, you know, fundraise here and there and stuff like that. So it was probably deemed too small to necessitate a kind of like this huge security response like you would have uh, with the radical Islamist jihadists. This was seen as a kind of like, you know, folklore, uh, if I could put it this way, and this folklore was largely to tolerated. Uh, we have a number of questions here. Uh, one here is uh, saying the way you talk about the foreign fighters, I have a hard time understanding which fighters are generally politically motivated and which fighters are simply, use, uh, simply using political conviction as an excuse to fight in the conflict. These people are hardly striking as people with political degrees. Could you elaborate on this? Thank you. Very good question. Some of them actually do have degrees and some of them actually have do they, they have the degrees in political science, which might be surprising, but they do. Uh, but I agree uh, quite a few of them. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll flip it a bit. They do project their political or practical fantasies onto a conflict. So if something matches, I had this you know, I had this feeling that in many cases they would jump at the opportunity to fight, to test themselves, to actually, you know, looking while well, looking for some adrenaline and actually saying, OK, I'm going to go and I will see if I, you know, if I have what it takes to fight in a war because that's a manly thing to do. And then, you know, I really want to see it. I've been interested in this. Na, 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 na. Uh, they were using this kind of thing as an excuse, but then they would be picking up bits and bobs of their political convictions or the political uh, feelings or visions vis-a-vis -vis the war in Ukraine, 
and putting them on an existing conflict. You know, this kind of, you know, I'm going there to fight Americans. Well, there are no Americans there. Or I'm going there to fight for white Europe. You know, Russians are also like predominantly white. Uh, the separatists are very much predominantly white. So I, I'm, I'm not sure what you're actually uh, what you're actually about here. But you know, these connections, yes, the adrenaline, the excuse would 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 come would come uh, sometimes at the expense of politics or clear cut ideological backgrounds. But I wouldn't say they don't have this kind of uh, ideological outlook. You know, they would at the same time they would be saying, you know, my Politics, it's mostly on the far, or no, they wouldn't say far right, but the patriotic right, nationalist right, that wasn't coming from nowhere. There were basically instances of this somehow, somehow per percolating into their minds, into their backgrounds and into their, into their activities, but I agree, these would be inflated or pragmatically, flexibly bent backwards and forwards so that they can accommodate themselves into a given unit and you know the best story is this guy who wanted to fight on the uh, separatist side didn't get a visa so went to fight with the ukrainians and that was fantastic so yes there were stories like that but there was some politics in it let's not forget even though they themselves were quite often telling me you know let's not be talking about this war is about effort it's not about these you know thoughts and ideas it's more about joint activities but uh, i would slightly slightly just slightly disagree there's a question here from Roy. Um, do you think Russia deliberately tries to fuel, enable and weaponize the European extreme right, both to increase polarization in Europe and also to keep the Ukraine conflict alive? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's we would probably need a separate webinar on that. Um, it's it's both. Russia, I think, weaponizes not only the far right, but it weaponizes anybody who's anti-systemic in Europe. Uh, it has a beautiful tendency of the two tendencies. One, it considers itself at, at war with its uh, international adversaries, not at war that tanks will drive down our streets, but in a, in a conflict, essentially. That's the mindset. And in this mindset, you will use anybody who's an enemy of your enemy as a potential ally, even those sometimes these groups would actually fight each other, but you'd still align with themselves, you know. I heard the best comments. Show me a conflict in in which Russia is not aligned with with individuals on both sides, and that's you know to some extent you could say far right, far left, radical, green, uh, anything. Honestly, anything out there to 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 stir up the pot, even though the returns sometimes are pretty paltry. You know, because the fact that you 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 align yourself with, with with forces that are beyond the pale politically and practically for the citizens of of Western Europe, uh, that doesn't work well. But it works better when you align with forces that actually win, maybe not win, but are close to winning elections. That's why Russia, and I think there are questions about, you know, the split, Ukrainian-Russian split on the on the far right, and Thomas alluded to that in his presentation, in his uh, comments as well. You know, Russia works very well with anti-systemic forces that get 10 to 20 percent uh, on in elections in different parts of Western Europe. Uh, and this is the official kind of Kremlin uh, support that they get almost governmental. You know, Vladimir Putin at, dancing at the wedding of the Russian, of the Austrian foreign affairs minister in uh, not a long time ago. That's a classic example. And she's from, you know, from the, uh, from a certain political party, uh, which, which aligns itself with Russia internationally. But at the same time, there are different layers of Russian support to anti-systemic groups, which are more beyond the pale starting from far right, going to far, far left, to all sorts of radicals who wouldn't get a dance from Vladimir Putin, uh, from Vladimir Putin uh, at a wedding, at their wedding, but they would get the support from someone like Dugin. He's not official. He's not someone who's the uh, blessed ambassador of, of Moscow, but he is useful. And, you know, no thing like that operates out of Moscow without some sort of the uh, sanction. So answering Roy's question, yes, Russia plays a role. It is overhyped. It's not unified as such there are different actors providing different bits and bobs of support and we've seen that yes ukraine is a perfect example you have a bottom-up mobilization you have a top-down mobilization you have genuine volunteers you have mercenaries you have the russian army you have the political technologists you have all sorts of people jumping in and maybe that's why it looks sometimes like a mess because it's not so well coordinated, you know, and we we just have to remember that Moscow does not play 3D chess underwater with us all the time. It has its own problems, it has its own challenges, and that's why sometimes it's not so successful. Yes, 
uh, could I ask a question uh, from my own side? Um, could you say something more about, since we are now in 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 uh, Norway and the Nordic countries, about the to what extent have Nordic right wing activists been involved? We know that there have been quite a lot of Swedes. We know a couple of cases from Norway. Uh, I don't know so much about Finland. Could you expand a little bit about that, so the, the role of Nordic right-wing extremists joining foreign fighters in the Ukraine conflict? Thank you, Tore. Certainly, Swedes, yes, uh, you nailed it. Sweden having a rather peculiar, uh, let's say, history with Russia, and uh, mobilizing people for Ukraine along these lines, and the Swedish far right, being anti-Russian before the war, but but there is obviously a catch. Uh, as much as the Nordic resistance movement was basically gaining strength and ground in the in the kind of far right or even extreme right circles in both Sweden and then and, and in Scandinavia, this was shifting. You know, Nordic resistance movement was basically identified by Russian actors as the you know organization that they could work with, that they could drag to another side. And even though some of the foot soldiers of the Nordic resistance movement were apparently, that's what I heard, and you know, from my conversations in Sweden and not only there, they would be keen on joining the Ukrainians in the war. And with the passage of time, the leadership was basically saying, no, you cannot go. You can go and train with the Russian imperial movement, but you will not go and fight for the Ukrainians. So even though Swedes and other Scandinavians were not joining en masse the other side, they would at least not be joining the Ukrainian side. With other mobilizations, you know, it's a pretty tricky one for Finns to join uh, the Russians and, and, and given the history that they have as well. But there were individual cases of Finnish guys on the other side, especially on the, as propagandists. So Putkonen, the, the name that you know circulates uh, uh, circulates uh, in online spheres, he was one of the of the propagandists, international propagandists, also pro broadcasting in English uh, for the separatists. But there were quite a few Finns who joined the Ukrainian side, but let's say anonymously. So you wouldn't know their names, and I call it in my publications the so-called ghosts, who would flock into Ukraine for like a month, two or three. They wouldn't overstay their visa, they would go back. Uh, they would go back, earn, earn some money, and then maybe come back as, and I quote, to shoot a few Ruskis in eastern Ukraine. Literally, that's what I, what I was told. There was a peculiar also movement on the Danish side. You know, the Danish Chechen community, they joined the Ukrainian side. They trekked through Germany and Poland into Ukraine and joined Ukrainians in the war, some high profile names. But then again, that's a pretty different mobilization. You wouldn't be expecting that, that kind of a move. And some examples of the Norwegian side with probably the most iconic one, a Russian Norwegian joining the other side. He's now living in Moscow. Mor Norway was trying to kind of get rid of him into, 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 into Russia. So peculiar things happening. The biggest thing in, the Swe in Sweden, Nordic resistance movement playing a role individuals, iconic individuals from almost any country out there. Pretty significant, the Swedish contingent, yes, not only the fighters, but also the support contingent, but from other countries to a much lesser extent. Let me have a question here from Oksana uh, Cheliseva. <laughs> um, have there been any documental evidence to Russian authorities assuring their far right to forget their crimes if they would can join uh, their side. That's a that's a good point. That's a very good question and a tricky and it's also a tricky one. Uh, you know, most of the fighters would play up this. I either didn't fight much, so the kind of Thomas would know this argument. I was just a cook in ISIS, um, so I, nobody fought. Everyone was a cook. Uh, here it's either I didn't fight much or I was just a professional soldier in a professional unit. There's very little evidence coming out of the front lines, and but there is, don't get me wrong, of their crimes out there, because I do feel that both sides uh, have a stake or have a, basically, they just don't want this evidence to, to, to come out, because even if there was evidence joining the foreign fighters, or linking the foreign fighters with the crimes out there, then it was mostly conducted within broader local units. So it wasn't that you could just slur the foreign fighters and say it's the foreign far right or whatever guys who conducted those crimes. You could put it on top of a local unit and basically embarrass either the separatists or even 
in this case, Ukraine. That's why there is relatively little enthusiasm on either side to help with these investigations. There is a lot of enthusiasm, especially in the Ukrainian side, and rightly so, don't get me wrong, to showcase the war crimes of the other side more broadly, not just the foreign fighters, or maybe differently, not just the Western foreign fighters, but also the Russian foreign fighters and the foreign, and basically the separatists. You know, Ukraine is co cooperating with the ICC, Russia isn't, and of course the separatists who are not uh, who are not recognized, they don't have a chance to cooperate. So that adds another dynamic there. I know there were attempts to go after some of the crimes in places like Sweden, but then again, it was Russia fronting this evidence. And you know, I know the Swedish authorities were a bit like you know scratching their heads, saying, "Can we really trust this? Is this really, you know, is this really genuine?" But yes, there were units, for example, of the Russian foreign fighters with the Norwegian guy, Jan Piotrowski, Norwegian Russian guy who would quite openly ISIS style put out videos of, well, basically them torturing uh, prisoners of war from the other side. So yes, you would find that and it's out there and I won't, won't tell you where because I'm not, it's not my job to actually showcase that type of an evidence. It is there, but again, in the sea of ISIS crime of this sort, I get the impression that the authorities in different countries just took a step back and said, OK, there isn't enough of this. We have to focus on something else. And still in 2021, they haven't figured out the response uh, in so many cases to the crimes of the ISIS foreign fighters committed out there uh, to prosecute them correctly. You know, these things are still in play. The, some certain countries do have a, still have a problem with actually going after them. There's still so much debate on whether we bring them back or not. Then this this is just like you know a drop in the ocean, really. And I think it's tragic, but that's the reality. Yeah, we have a long question here from Arsenio Kuencha, uh, or how to pronounce it. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mr. Rikavik. Your contributions are always of great interest. I wanted to know if you have further information about leftist and red-brown Spanish fighters in the Donbass. Yesterday you shared an article discussing the presence of reconstruction communista militants on the pro-Russian side, a uh, red-brown uh, group and school. Uh, um, two reliable sources in Spain told me that it was not their their case, uh, not the case, I don't uh, uh, that Spanish foreign fighters in Ukraine came from far left and even left organizations, including the Colectivo, the Juanos, uh, I don't know, I'm not even good in Spanish, Comunistas, and uh, yeah, uh, it is Guardiana Unida, <laughs> yeah, my Spanish is bad. Uh, could you elaborate on this? Thank you again. Thank you, Tore. Thank you, Arsenia. We, we, I'll need to reach out to him separately because uh, I think that's a longer conversation. Uh, there is, I think that adds to the to the confusion. There is an organization uh, in Russia called the Essence of Time, which combines Stalinism, so pretty far left to me. I mean, I put it out there with a bit of Russian orthodoxy, if you, if you like. And this organization was successful with luring certain Spanish individuals into the mix. Now, whether they were uh, that type of Spanish far left or that, Arsenio, you're way better, you know it way better than I do. Uh, for me, they were pretty far left, but maybe I'm biased coming from a post-communist country. Uh, but this organization was successful in actually uh, advocating this kind of a movement. And this organization had some success with this in Italy as well, where some of these Spanish guys actually went to Ukraine via sometimes boat, car to Italy first. They would do a festival, a concert, and then they would, you know, jump in a car or cars and drive drive eastward. So there was a whole trek like that. And it was coming to my knowledge from the from the far left. And it was to my knowledge instigated or, you know, helped uh, associate or assisted by this organization called the Essence of Time. Do look it up and I'll gladly have a conversation with you uh, on that later on. And I hope it helps. Yeah, and then there's a question here. Um, there have been reports of ISIS members coming to Ukraine as a safe haven, as well as uh, Chechens going to Ukraine to get military experience and fight the Russians. Have you seen this in your research? Yes, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's something that, that uh, continues to, to, to dumbfound everybody, but let's put it this way. If you have a country that for, in its own view, right reasons, it's fighting Russia and it's anti-Russian in its political and social feeling. Uh, 
It is keen to welcome sometimes all sorts of people who would be flocking under its banners. Uh, sometimes from, well, yeah, probably Islamist milieus from Western Europe, you know, these or maybe not even, if not Islamists, these would be veterans of the previous Chechen wars, like Munayev from Denmark, you know, the individual that I spoke about earlier. Then if you add to that the fact that the uh, security structures of the Ukrainian state were in a bit of a flux after 2014 and the Euro Euromaidan revolution, that Russia had a hand in those structures, that they would be comp competing with one another, that some of its elements would be pretty corrupt. Yes, I can see a situation in which uh, ISIS or whatever Syrian faction, Chechen individual ends up in Ukraine and claims that he's anti-Russian and he wants to fight or that he is, you know, he is being persecuted in Russia. Will you please give me an asylum? Or he simply bribes his way into Ukraine. Yes, I've seen incidences of that. And you can see the Ukrainian security service, the SBU, periodically making arrests like that and saying that we've dismantled this, saying that we are not the guys, you know, this country is not a hub or a nest for these guys. But for certain, you know, for certain uh, cases, yes, this would probably be some kind of a transit country for individuals loosely or not so loosely associated with Islamist factions in Syria, probably wanting to go westwards, probably using Ukraine as a springboard, probably using Ukraine as a lair or, you know, place to get some rest or to simply lie low. Yes, I've seen that. To extent this was connected to the war, probably to a lesser extent, please do remember that there's quite a good few Chechens on the other side uh, fighting on the sides of the separatists who also who also fought in the Chechen wars and who quite often would have pretty, you know, let's say conservative Islamist views, if I could put it mildly. So it's just a bit more, bit more complicated than that. But yes, yes, that's I've seen that it's probably slightly overhyped, but you know, when you see the Ukrainian moves, they are conscious of that and they are pushing pushing back against that type of a narrative with these arrests and saying, hey, we, we have a hand on this. You know, we really, we can really tackle this. Could I add a question to both uh, Thomas and, and uh, Kasper? Um, one of the big concerns about foreign fighters is that they may uh, constitute a threat of terrorism when they return back to their home countries. And uh, Thomas uh, wrote uh, a famous study on on uh, on the prevalence of uh, of um, foreign fighters, return foreign fighters being involved in terrorist attacks uh, in their homelands uh, when uh, when they came back. Uh, could you give us a little bit update on that, Thomas? And also, Casper, uh, if there have been any any uh, studies of uh, the prevalence of involvement in terrorism uh, by returned foreign fighters in the extreme right. Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the reason people are concerned about uh, Islamist foreign fighters um, uh, is uh, that, you know, historically, um, they have been overrepresented among plotters and attackers in the West. And I think it's reasonable to assume that kind of the, 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 the mechanism for kind of why foreign fighters are, you know, are or have been relatively dangerous is two things. What the, so one is you have a self-selection effect so that in order to to join a faraway war zone, you have to be pretty ideologically committed. Uh, so you don't get the opportunists, you get people who are really into the cause, uh, and you probably also get the military minded people, uh, the people who really like to get their hands on a gun and that sort of thing. And the other factor is what we might call a treatment effect, that the very experience of being in a war zone and hanging out with other, you know, you know self-selected radicals uh, affects people and makes them more hardline um, than they would have been if they hadn't been in the war zone. And um, so and I, and I think this this you know, is very plausible and I think there's a lot of circumstantial evidence to say that you know these these mechanisms uh, are you know are, are at work. Now this doesn't mean that all foreign fighters are super dangerous. So, you know, the, you know, even in the, even for the 
foreign fighter destinations that have that sort of produced the most attackers in the West. You know, we're still talking about, you know, you know, at most a few tens of percent of like you know, from the people who went say to Al Qaeda training camps in Afghanistan uh, in the late 90s. Uh, you know, it was far from everyone that later got involved in a, in, a, in, a, in, in, in in a plot. So, but but you know, compared with you know a random sample of the population, they're strongly overrepresented. Now, what's happened in the past decade is that governments have realised this um, and have implemented countermeasures. Uh, in particular, they've kind of calibrated the counter-terrorism apparatus and the intelligence efforts, or it's, it's not calibrated, but rather sort of uh, oriented towards tracking and, um, and sort of monitoring foreign fighters, making it much harder for veterans of, say, Syria to get anything done operationally. So, and this highlights a really crucial aspects of, I think, you know, threat analysis more broadly in terrorism, which is that terrorism is a strategic game. So what terrorists do and are able to do depends heavily on what we do and what states do. And there's a there's a tendency to, to forget this, to sort of analyze terrorists in isolation and to try to sort of understand their behavior or their kind of their strategic choices purely in terms of kind of their, you know, of, of, of their own kind of ideological preferences or, you know, uh, decisions. But we forget that what they do and are able to do is shaped to a great extent by countermeasures. And this is really nicely illustrated, I think, with foreign fighters, because uh, we can say, I think, that um, European kind of government approach to Islamist foreign fighters changed radically around 2013. It went from kind of, um, you know, sort of um, light to heavy repression. Uh, and <clears throat> it had the effect of uh, going, for, we went from a situation then of foreign fighters being overrepresented uh, in attack planning and having a higher chance of reaching of their plots reaching execution to the opposite. We now see that f plots involving an, a foreign fighter has a higher risk of getting foiled. So there's a lower kind of they have a lower prob probability of reaching the point of execution. And overall, there are very few plots and attacks today or in the in recent years that involve veterans from from Syria. Uh, but I think it's you know, I think it's that's very likely because so much of the counter-terrorism effort has been directed towards them. So what you're left with is, is, is a situation where the foreign fighters all get caught because they've been tracked for years and the security services know about it. And as soon as they kind of try and do something, they get, they get arrested. So, and, and that most of the plots and attacks in recent years have been by people who have not had a history of going to, to Syria um, and many of them in fact have been sort of uh, you know solo attackers and, it, and this is an I think a direct effect of state behavior. Um, so it's, it's our counterterrorism policies and, 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 and strategies that have shaped the type of attacks and, 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 and operations that, uh, that, that that we see. And this is, I think, relevant to the question, to the debate about Ukraine, because, Kasper, you mentioned uh, this tendency for the veterans to form an alumni community. Uh, you know, and it's, it's a club. Uh, the people know each other, they trust each other, and you know, they go from one conflict to another. Now, this is double edged. It's, you know, great for coherence. Um, uh, and it's potentially concerning because this is, you know, is a powerful, you know, network. At the same time, it's very vulnerable because once an intelligence service knows that 
they have been to the Ukraine, you know, that puts them in a special category. And they, you can, they, they're, they're kind of, they stand out as, as veterans and make them vulnerable to repression should states decide to pursue them. So this uh, kind of, this, these dynamics are, are, are I think, uh, quite, quite important. Uh, thank you, thank Thomas, you Thomas, and thank you for, thank the, you. for the questions, Tora. Uh, I'll, I'll just, I'll be, I'll be brief. Uh, in my view, it works like this. The individuals that I spoke to, they would be vehemently saying that no way, no way, of course, we're not militant in this sense. But it's not that they are so um, benign, so to speak. Uh, one of them told me, something that I think gives an answer to, to the question. He says, look, I don't believe this will get us anywhere in Europe. This will get us anywhere where I live. It was a Frenchman actually saying this because the deck is stacked against us anyway. So what if we were to go on a rampage here or there? He wasn't even saying terrorist, but then he got to that. It, it doesn't get us anything. But if you remember, one of the kind of ideological elements of which they might not even know about, but one of the in the circles of the far right, there is this notion of a Belgian theoretician called Jean Thiriard, and Thiriard has been pontificating about something like the European Brigade. Find a conflict nearby Europe, meaning we nearby Western Europe. So Balkans were fantastic. Ukraine is fantastic. Uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan conflict would also be fantastic. Get together there, train, and you know, see how many of you are there. And maybe at some point your services will be called upon in the struggle for a patriotic nationalist Europe, even if it's 10, 20, well, whatever years, let's go along these roads. So I think if these guys are political enough in this sense, they would probably be thinking along these lines. They're not thinking about terrorism at home. They might be thinking about political violence at home, you know, against their political vis-a-vis -vis and opponents, you know, migrants, far left or what have you, but not outright terroristic violence in this sense. But it not, does not mean that they will not look for opportunities abroad when actually one of the ideological, let's say, inputs that fires them is this idea of, yeah, you have to go and test yourself. You have to go and get together and count yourselves and, you know, and see how operationally safe you are before you come back and maybe you'll find something for yourself. So that's that's the approach. That would be my answer to the question, Tore. OK, uh, our time is almost up. Uh, some of us have uh, new meetings in a couple of minutes. So I thanks, thank a lot to, to Kasper and Thomas for their contributions. And we will come back with the new uh, webinars uh, later on. Thank you. Bye bye.